So, welcome. Welcome uh, chaplains, welcome mission partners, council members, ICS staff, friends. You're hugely welcome. And then I watch the numbers gather up and I see my friends appear on the screen. It's great to see you. Um, what should be happening now is we should be having just had breakfast at High Lee. We should have all enjoyed a full English and would now be feeling quite sort of, hmm, that's, that's good. Um, so it's a very different experience and I appreciate that. The planning group, that's Ben Harding, who uh, is in Lyon, Hilary Jones, who's in Basel, Adrian Strangholt in the Netherlands, Dale Hansen in Versailles, and Jelena, who's in Coventry here with me. Uh, the planning group, we felt having put the conference together, when all this uh, broke out and the conference centre cancelled on us, we felt it was still worthwhile that we uh, did something and that we at least enjoyed the Bible teaching and had an opportunity to be together as we are now. So that's all by way of introduction. It's really good to be with you all again. Let me just pray. Father, it's good to be with friends. And as we gather together for this hour, be with us, we pray. Inspire us. May we feel the intimacy we have, even though there's this distance between us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so it's my pleasure to hand over to Ben in Lyon, who's going to lead us in a time of worship. Ben. My next role is to introduce Simon, and uh, it's a great joy to be able to do that, Simon. And um, it's so, so good to have you here with us uh, these, over this conference. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> great to be with you. Oh, it's brilliant. It's so good to have you with us. And... Um, it's a, it's a great privilege to have you here uh, with us today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and joining in with our ministries around Europe. Um, personally, it's a great joy for me to be able to introduce you because uh, I think I said yes, to you, yes to, to you yesterday. You're someone who's been speaking faith into me and my family for over 15 years now. So it's a great joy to have you here with us today. Uh, you have a tremendous gift of being able to draw out the riches of the word uh, with openness and insight into the Holy Spirit. But also mixed into a cocktail with grit and reality of what it looks like to have life before and after Jesus. Uh, I know that for a fact that you've inspired many people into gospel ministry and wow. encouraged people to already in it. Well, that's a beautiful thing to say. I'm really honoured. Thank you. Oh, that's true. Somewhere in the ether out there in an old email account, there's an email that, uh, or an email correspondence between us and you're encouraging a young curate to think out of the box yeah. and uh, to venture into new territories. And, and I just wanted to you know, say thank you for that because that's part of the conversation that's led us to where we are now serving in France. I didn't know that. Thank you, Ben. Praise God. Yeah, amen. So for those of you who don't know, Simon uh, is the uh, part of the clergy team um, and pastor of theology at St. Aldate's Church in Oxford in the UK, uh, having trained at Bristol. Is that right, Simon? Best in the West. Oh, <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a few colleagues here and allies from Trinity. And um, I was going to just ask you a couple of quick questions, just as sort of a, an icebreaker. <laughs> um, what, when was the last time you were on the European continent? Um, well, I used to go there um, quite regularly, but for the last year I took a sort of sabbatical from traveling too far away. Um, I've done a, uh, several hundred conferences in the last few years and I was feeling burnt out. So last year I just stayed near home and pulled out of a lot of things. Um, so I didn't go last year, the year before that, um, normally I go two or three times to Scandinavia, Germany. Um, the last time was just before Christmas, 18 months ago, um, in Switzerland, in Thun, beautiful Thun for a conference. Uh, <laughs> a few months before that, I was in Ulm, in Germany. Um, uh, a few months before that, I was in Copenhagen, I think, or something. Yeah, yeah brilliant. So, 
there, there'll be a few people from Switzerland here. You might see them waving. One, I see that you're in Switzerland next year. I, you invited me for High Lee. <laughs> Switzerland next year. I mean, yeah, I have to have a word with the boss. <clears throat> <laughs> And then, um, so what uh, is there one thing, or is, is there something that you have discovered that's been a bit of a joy? It's sort of a lockdown discovery. Oh, I'm not sure if discovery is the right word, but um, I've really enjoyed time with my wife and my son at home. Um, my youngest is on his gap year, and uh, he was meant to be in Europe on the continent. Uh, mainland but um, is stuck here so I've just enjoyed being home uh, I've enjoyed having evenings off I've enjoyed um, cooking uh, and I've enjoyed not having to go out to work in the evening mm. yeah I suspect yeah. there might be some sentiments echoed here in the same way <laughs> thanks Simon can I pray for you before we start please before start to share thank you Lord, thank you so much for gathering us together this morning. And as we've heard through the Easter story, Lord, as you burst through the tomb, you united disciples, you revealed your truth and poured out your spirit behind locked doors. We pray for Simon. Thank you for your presence with him in the preparation in the silence and in the speaking. We pray that you might continue to speak your truth and pour out your spirit beyond and through our locked doors here this morning. For our good and your glory. Amen. 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 Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Ben. Well, it's a privilege to be with you and uh, thanks so much for the invitation. And um, I had uh, a number of conferences lined up to be at and they've all cancelled except this one and how wonderful that you've uh, gone for it online and I'm rubbish at technology uh, I'd not heard the word zoom a month ago but what a beautiful wonderful thing it is that can connect us with one another so that we can be connected with the Lord together um, over the next few days together uh, I'm not going to say anything or attempt to say anything profound about the coronavirus and church's response and, 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 you know, there's time to reflect on that and I'm not the man for it. I just want to open up um, three gospel cameos, really, and encourage us uh, around the Lord. So if you've got a Bible, would you turn to Luke chapter 2? Luke chapter 2, and uh, I want us to read from verse 22. And this is the well-known passage of the presentation of Jesus in the temple. So I'll read and then we'll tuck in. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every first male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, that a pair of doves or two young pigeons be offered. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what was the custom of the law. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. 
And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. In 1973, Pink Floyd produced an epic album that I often listen to called Wish You Were Here. And the title track of the album has been described as one of the greatest songs ever. It's a matter of taste, of course. In 2019, there was a Financial Times article celebrating this song, and it described it as having universal resonance. Wish you were here. And the writer, David Gilmore, said that it was about a general feeling of absence, that something or someone was missing. And the chorus that some of you will know goes, how I wish, how I wish you were here. We're just two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl year after year, running over the same old ground. What have we found? The same old fears. I wish you were here. And whether shut down in our coronavirus world or free to come and go as we please, so many feel just like that. A sense of loneliness and absence and isolation and just repetition and disillusionment, like lost souls aimlessly swimming around that fishbowl full of fear. And that's the reality that we as ministers minister into. But at times, that's the reality that we as ministers can feel ourselves. And this song expresses, I think, a, a universal and existential longing. And that can only be met by Jesus, who wants to meet it. We don't live wishing that he was here. He is Emmanuel. He is here, the God who is present. And by his spirit, we can welcome him daily, welcome his presence, not live with his absence. Now old Simeon in our passage wished he was here and he'd waited and prayed and looked and longed for a long time for him to be here. And then in this amazing cameo, he is able to move from that wishing he was here to welcome him here. And I want to reflect just briefly this morning on Simeon. Simeon's the Hebrew form of the Greek name Simon, and I wish I could live up to his name and his character. If we look at verse 25 and 26, Luke, in just the briefest of brushstrokes, portrays this most beautiful man. We're told he was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for God and anointed by the Spirit, and he heard the voice of God, and he lived by faith in God's word. And I think that's as good a description as any for the qualities and necessities for a minister of the gospel, indeed for a disciple of Jesus. Now Luke doesn't tell us this, but ancient sources suggest that old Simeon is Simeon ben Hillel, who was the head of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish parliament, and he died in 10 AD. And he was the son of the most famous Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, and was the father to another famous rabbi, Gamaliel, the distinguished leader and rabbi who taught Paul, who previously was Saul. Well, in accordance with Mosaic law from Leviticus 12.3, 40 days after giving birth to a son, Mary brings herself and Jesus to the temple to offer sacrifices to present Jesus to God and give thanks and to receive her own ritual purification. And I want to highlight just two things for us this morning. Firstly, Simeon held Jesus. It says in verse 28, Simeon took Jesus 
in his arms. Simeon took Jesus in his arms. Now many mothers had carried their babies to the temple that day, no doubt. Just like every day, the parents brought their children to offer back to God their firstborn sons and to receive ritual cleansing. And I wonder if Simeon went to the temple every day looking and longing and peering at every little child wrapped up in a bundle and asking God, is this the one today? And every day as he looked at the child, there was no yes from the Holy Spirit that was upon him. And then one day this poor rural peasant couple turn up and there's nothing to make them stand out. They're, they're easily lost in a crowd, but their baby in the bundle changes everything. And Simeon goes over and Simeon sees and the spirit moves him and he knows. And he takes this infant in his arms. He takes the one in his arms who holds the whole world in his. God is not a shadow. He's not a dream or a specter. He's not a belief, a doctrine, a proposition. He is a person and he's substantial and tangible and corporeal and real and visceral. And he comes amongst us. He doesn't dwell in splendid self-isolation. God is never the God in lockdown. God does not leave the room the moment we enter. I've been thinking about Rudolf Otto lately and his sense of the absence of God, mysterium tremendum, and, and a God known in, as if we walk in a room and he walks out, he's known apophatically and so on. God is known by his presence. The cry heard from an angel at the end of Revelation 21 verse 3 has always been God's goal. Look, says the angel, the dwelling place of God is now with men and women. And God has willed from all eternity to come to be with us and to hold us and be held by us. And Jesus opens wide his arms from the crib to the cross, inviting embrace. God has never merely wanted our confession of him. He's never merely wanted our profession in creeds. God wills to be held. And it's humankind that has kept God at arm's length. It's humankind who hid from God when God came visiting in the cool of the day in the garden. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah mourns in chapter 64, 7, he says, there is none that call on your name, none that stir themselves up to take hold of you. God wants us to take hold of him. And especially at this time, this coronavirus time of shutdown and lockdown, God is not shut down and locked down, and he's not in isolation. By his spirit, he's present, and he wants us to take hold of him. Now, this idea of holding Jesus has been savoured by the saints throughout the church history. We find it in Oregon, who in the second century talked about finding wholeness by holding on to Jesus. It's a, a long quote, but he says this, For as long as I did not hold Christ, as long as my arms did not enfold him, I was imprisoned and unable to escape from my bounds. Anyone who departs from this world, anyone who is released from prison and the house of those in chains to go forth and reign should take Jesus in his hands. He should enfold Jesus with his arms and fully grasp him in his bosom. Then he will be able to go enjoy where he longs to go. What a great quote. That wholeness and healing is found when we hold on to Jesus. Holding on to Jesus sets us free from our bonds. I love what the German reformer Martin Luther wrote. He said, let us keep to Christ and let us cling to him and hang on to him so that no power can remove. Cling to the one who clings to us. How do we do that? Well, 
We do it in prayer and studying his word. We, we do it through the sacraments. The beautiful Edward Pusey, who was a, a wonderful saintly Anglo-Catholic, late Victorian era, he said these words, Mary in her womb did hold Christ the natural body, and the minister holdeth the mystery of the body. And we who receive bread and wine by faith and the action of the spirit really spirit and spiritually hold and are held by Jesus. What an amazing thing to hold the Lord. I remember the first time I held my wife. It was in the West Country where I'm from. And uh, it was in Clevedon. I'd been a butcher in Clevedon. And uh, it was November 1987. That was the first time I held her. I remember the first time I held my first son in Bradford Hospital in 1998. And I remember the first time I held on to Jesus in June 1985 in Holy Trinity Nailsey in Somerset. This is a good time to remember when you first held on to Jesus. And maybe you've let go of him and maybe other things have filled your heart and your mind. And Ministry can cause us to lose grip on the Lord. Ministry can somehow take the Lord away from us. And at this time, dear saints, I want to encourage you to hold on to him. In Song of Songs, chapter 3 and verse 4, there's a great line, and the lover says this, I searched for the one my heart loved. Says it about three times, and then says, I found the one my heart loved, and I held him, and I would not let him go. This is the time to hold him and not let him go. Simeon held the Lord. That's the first thing. And then secondly, Simeon beheld the Lord. It says in verse 29, my eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon, from the Hebrew root Shema, means hearing. I'm called Simon. My name means hearing, but I wear hearing aids because I'm deaf. Simeon heard the Lord, and he also saw the Lord. Like Job, he says, who said, I've heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And only the one who holds is close enough to behold. Most people in the temple saw just another Jewish infant of an artisan family from northern Galilee. Their eyes saw, but they didn't see. There was nothing special to them. Only Simeon and Anna the prophetess saw. Many of you be familiar with Helen Keller, who was blind blind and deaf from the age of two. And she was once asked by uh, a young boy, isn't it the worst thing in the world to be blind? And she replied, not half as bad as having two eyes, but seeing nothing. And many people go their whole lives not seeing, and not seeing the Lord who wants to be seen and held. And what was it Simeon saw in this child? Well, in verse 29 to 35 of our reading, there are a number of things that he declares. This child was going to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles, not just Israel's Messiah, but this is the king of the universe. And this child would be for the glory of God's people, Israel. They were humble they were humiliated by roman occupation and by the greeks before that and that they've always been humiliated and yet they've always been glorious because of god's purpose and promise through them and this child would cause the rise and fall of many and this child would expose the thoughts of the hearts of many and most importantly in verse 31 Simeon says, my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the sight of all people. And this tiny little child, this bundle wrapped up, brought to God, is actually God's gift to the world to save the world. And the remarkable and terrible thing is that 
this child will save the world by not saving himself. This child is born to die. And that's why Simeon will say in verse 35 to Mary, a sword will pierce your heart also. And who is salvation for? For all the people. And how is salvation to be received? Well, by sight of the Savior, by looking to the one who can save. We're saved by seeing and saying yes to him. My dad's a Baptist minister. I was brought up with Spurgeon. And Spurgeon was saved as a lad, age 16. And he tells his testimony in his autobiography. And he was sat in a balcony at church. He'd gone to church a lot. He'd never really got into it. And he'd never met the Lord. And Spurgeon recalls that there was a visiting sort of yokel preacher a lay preacher and he said uh, Spurgeon says this that the preacher spoke and these are his words this is a very simple text indeed it says look now looking don't take a deal of pain it ain't lifting your foot or your finger it is just look well a man needn't go to college to learn to look and you may be the biggest fool and yet you can look and a man needn't be worth a thousand pounds a year to look. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. And then Spurgeon says, fixing, the man fixed his eyes on Spurgeon and said, young man, you look very miserable. And you will always be miserable. Miserable in life and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey it, you will be saved. And then he raises his hands and shouted at Spurgeon, young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You've got nothing to do but to look and live. And Spurgeon, of course, at that moment was overwhelmed and encountered by the gospel invite and demand. And he responded to Jesus and became a great minister who spent his whole life telling people to look and live. Look and live. Jesus saves those who look to him. He always has and he always will. And those who hold him like Simeon, those who behold him like Simeon, are those who know what it is to be saved and who can then depart in peace. This year I've had various eye problems, been visiting the opticians and hospital and specialists. And uh, several prophetic friends of mine have asked whether or not it was a symbol for in the natural and physical of what's going on in the spiritual, the eye being a window of the soul. And they were asking me if I, I'd got a wrong focus, if something's wrong spiritually. I've been seeking the Lord about that. We've got to look to the Lord. But sometimes our gaze is taken away. Personal issues, far away things, abstractions, sometimes our vision of the Lord is eclipsed by stuff. And Jesus gets pushed to the periphery, even as ministers. And I want to encourage you, in this lockdown period, look to the Lord. Well, I need to finish. The famous artist Rembrandt painted two main paintings of Simeon and of uh, the presentation of Christ at the temple. The first was when he was a young artist, aged 25, in Amsterdam in 1631. And it was called Simeon's Song of Praise. And it was a classic kind of Dutch wide angle scene. The artist's vista was standing back and taking in everything. He was observing the observers. And he paints numerous figures and detailed temple architecture and finely detailed clothing and a play on light and dark and the young artist was showing us just how talented he is it's called Simeon's Song of Praise it's his first painting of this story but if you look at it and I encourage you to have a look afterwards online it lacks soul it lacks power we can see Rembrandt's brilliant but it's got no heart Almost four decades later, in 1669, the day after Rembrandt died, his friends found in his workshop his final painting that he'd kept for himself. 
And again, it was of Simeon and the presentation of Jesus. But this time, there is no temple and no crowds and no fine frippery and no architecture. This time, the focus is where the focus should be. It's just on Simeon's old face, bathed in light and holding and beholding the luminous Jesus. And the wonderful thing is that Simeon's face is Rembrandt's own face. And this is a self-portrait. Simeon's mouth, Rembrandt's mouth, open and singing the nunc dimittis. Now let your servant depart in peace. And Rembrandt's eyes, Simeon's eyes are closed in awe because he has really seen. And no longer is this young gifted artist showing us what he can do stood at a distance, but he's painted himself into the story and he's holding and beholding Jesus, ready to be dismissed, his eyes having seen salvation. And dear saints, I want to encourage you wherever you are, however you are, that in this season, refocus, hold, hold him and behold him. By his spirit, Jesus is at hand. Do you join me in prayer? Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you are for us. Thank you that you're with us. And I pray for all these dear ministers and chaplains, Lord, in the Middle East and on the European mainland, wherever they are serving you and serving your people. I pray that over these coming weeks and months, they would be refreshed in their walk with you. And once again, in, or in a deeper, more wonderful way, they would know what it is to hold on to you and to behold you. And they would know what it is for you to be beholding them, your gaze on them, and for you to hold them. And then, Lord, when we come out of this crazy time, may we be better equipped to hold you out to the world so that all can see your salvation. We bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, saints. Uh, I look forward to sharing with you tomorrow. And I'll hand back now to Hilary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I um, thank someone, I'd like to just have one or two moments of silence. Uh, just an opportunity for us to reflect on all that we've just heard. Um, to reflect on the fact that Simeon saw and held the Lord, who will ultimately bring us all salvation. So just one or two moments of silence. And now I'd like to thank Simon so much for a wonderful Bible study that was so inspiring and so relevant to our lives at the moment. It's so easy when we're in ministry, as you said, to um, forget why we're actually here and to get so busy. So thank you so much for reminding us that our God is not a God of lockdown that he's not a God in isolation, that he is present with us at all times, 
And thank you for reminding us that our job is to hang on to Jesus, to cling to him and to embrace him and to encourage others to do the same and not to get uh, so busy that we forget that. So thank you so much, Simon. And I really look forward uh, to hearing what you have to say tomorrow. So we're now going to move on to another worship song. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Hilary. We're going to sing a song now, uh, which some people are going to hate <laughs> and uh, some people are going to love. And I asked the team yesterday, uh, who, who knows this song and who doesn't? And um, I, I think it's probably one of those songs that it would be good to start to learn. Uh, for us at, in Lyon, it's become a bit of an anthem uh, as lockdown and we started to sing it more and more regularly. But I first heard it uh, with a group of squaddies who were based in uh, Kabul and the chaplain there was leading a service and um, the service was piped through his phone and, um, and there were a bunch of paratroopers stood around singing this song. And um, it's a song about hope. It's a song that draws on Old Testament images of the Lord leading his people. Um, but it's also a song of great declaration of our love and faith in the Lord Jesus. So if you hate it, don't worry about it. Let it wash over you. If you want to learn it, join in. If you know it already, sing it with all your heart. Uh, it's my lighthouse and it's my lighthouse. Let's sing together. I love the way it picked up the theme of being carried uh, and what Simon was saying earlier. I love I couldn't help smiling to myself that somebody knew what songs to pick and it wasn't me. It sounds like the Lord had his hands on those. Come here, Larry. Oh, thanks, Ben. So let us now pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity we've had to worship together, to, re to hear and to receive your holy word. We thank you for Simon who has inspired us this morning as he unfolded scripture for us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit may constantly open our eyes to read, our ears to hear. And we pray that you will open our hearts to receive Jesus. We remember in our prayers, those who have not been able to join us this morning, any whom are ill, for whom we pray for a speedy recovery and for those ministering to them. We hold before you our many and varied chaplaincies in Europe and beyond, the ICS team in the UK and all the many supporters of ICS around the world. We pray, Lord, that we may be faithful in preaching the gospel and bringing the hope of Jesus Christ to all those with whom we have contact contact. And now we close our prayers by joining together in the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.